I am Missy Rude. I am a director of experience strategy for healthcare clients at Hero Digital. Um, I come from a long background of design, art direction, and animation, actually. So. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And what is your talk on today? Today, I'm going to talk about getting security and accessibility just right. And I want to thank everyone who went before me today for setting this up so perfectly. It really does feel like we planned this. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm going to leave you in your very capable hands. Yep. Look forward to listening to your talk. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Well, I hope everyone is ready to talk, first of all, more about outer space and also fairy tales, possibly also UX. We'll see. So earlier we had a little bit of conversation about friction and when to apply it and when it's a problem. And this is something that's really, really fascinated me since I've been involved in UX and especially for healthcare clients. Because, of course, we do understand friction usually as something to be avoided. It's a pain point. But there are times that you do actually need to apply it because it is important to slow the user down in order to get the result you want. And that's in particularly important in cases of security. So there's a high standard for security and accessibility in healthcare. And so how do you reconcile those two things when you need to have high friction for a secure experience and low friction for an accessible experience? Is there actually a way to balance these? And can we find the experience that is just right? So I think the most important thing to understand to start off with is, of course, that it's not really negotiable whether or not we have secure experiences in healthcare. It shouldn't be negotiable anyway, but in healthcare, the consequences are so critical. You could end up exposing someone who's in a domestic violence situation. You could end up exposing their data to someone who might harm them. We could end up exposing maybe a trans youth who does not have an affirming family. There are just so many risks. And so it's really, really critical that we have very, very good security in all of our experiences. Now, to be clear, security is our responsibility. It's not the user's responsibility. But obviously, they're a partner in this. They are going to be interacting with our experience. So we still have to make sure that the experience is designed to be secure for them and to encourage secure practices. It's also important to keep in mind that many health conditions are disabling. Um, the example I always turn to is multiple sclerosis because a lot of people are familiar with it. And it's such an interesting condition because of the fact that many people will actually present as abled a lot of the time when they have multiple sclerosis. But if they're having a flare up, then they're potentially having mobility impairments, vision impairments, cognitive impairments, and more. I had a user testing participant who had multiple sclerosis and she said that she had uh, red days, yellow days, and green days. And she said on green days, I would have no problem interacting with your pro product, no problem at all. But on red days, I absolutely would not be able to use this. And of course, red days are the days that she most needs our healthcare product. It absolutely has to work for her on those days. So this is really important to keep in mind is that Anyone can become dis disabled, but also it's critical. They, this is when they most need care, is at the moment when they probably are less abled than they might other otherwise be. And that brings me to another really important point, which is we talk about how you know, one in six people are disabled. Um, but we also talk about situational disabilities. You know, we said, right, if you're in a crowded space and it's loud, then you can't hear as well. Or if you're carrying your baby, then, you know, you can't use your other arm as much and these kinds of things. So, yes, these are true. But I also want to consider that stress is disabling. Pain is disabling. I had a sick child, took them to the doctor. And I was so upset about my kid being in pain and not feeling well. And they were upset that when the nurse who was doing the intake asked me for their date of birth, I forgot. I forgot my kid's date of birth because I was so upset. 
And so what that means is that we need to seriously consider the possibility that rather than having abled and disabled users, nearly all patients are to some extent disabled when they interact with the healthcare system. I'm actually gonna repeat it. Nearly all patients are to some extent disabled when they interact with the healthcare system. So potentially our entire population is disabled when they're using our products. And this is really, really important. I do think it also applies to providers to a great extent. We talked earlier about physician burnout and they're not at their best, they're stressed. Maybe they just pulled a double, double shift to cover for their colleague and now they've worked 24 hours straight. So they're exhausted and uh, you know, they're to some extent disabled as well when they're using these products. So then we go back to, again, these are potentially opposing user experiences. For security, we do have to slow the user down. We're maybe adding steps so we avoid errors, as we discussed earlier. Uh, maybe give them more detailed information so they have full context for whatever it is that they need to do. And for accessibility, they need the opposite of pretty much all of that. They need it much simpler. They need us to reduce steps for ease, keep our copy really brief, direct, clear. This is really, really important. So how can we deliver what these users need? And it is tempting to say that what we need is compromise, but if that means that we're giving the users less security or less accessibility, then it's not good enough. So instead of compromise, what we really need is balance. And so again, like Goldilocks, we don't want too hot, we don't want too cold, we don't want too much friction, we don't want too little friction. We want an experience that is just right. And so what is the Goldilocks zone? This is what we're looking for. We're looking for a balance that seems like it should be impossible because it's so rare. And in astrophysics, this is the distance from a star that's not too close and not too far, but just right, where a planet could have liquid water and potentially support life. They've discovered only a handful of planets so far in this zone. So it is incredibly rare. It's hard to find. But that's what we're looking for, a digital health experience that has not too much friction, not too little, just right. So how are we going to find this habitable zone? Well, we have some ways that we can do that. I know it looks like a long list, but I promise that all of these will build on the rest with the intention of giving us the tools we need to eventually be able to solve what seem like impossible problems, to find the balance that seems like it couldn't possibly exist. So briefly, we're going to define the boundaries. We need the edges of our zone. Don't pass outside of these. We need don't do these things. It's actually do's and don'ts, but it's more don'ts than do's. Basically just saying, here's a few things you can rule out right away and get to the, the solutions that will work for you. Two-factor authentication. Can't have a conversation about security without talking about that, but is it accessible? We'll see. Biometrics, same question. Form fills and check boxes. I know it sounds really specific. Why are we going into the details of this interface? But as we saw from Duncan earlier, it's actually really important to accessibility um, and security. So uh, it's just important we follow good practices there. Error prevention. Again, we already discussed this, so we'll definitely go over that. It's really critical for both providers and patients and really anyone who interacts with the healthcare system because the consequences are so bad. Plain language. It seems very basic, but it's a really difficult problem for us to solve because it's healthcare and nothing is simple. So how can we possibly use simple language to describe it? And lastly, this is gonna be an example of sort of the, the impossible problem that we will be trying to solve, which is withdrawing consent. And we'll talk about what that means when we get there. Basically means when someone doesn't want someone to be able, to, when someone does not want another person to be able to access their data anymore. How do we do that in a secure and accessible way? So most people are going to assume first off that, well, we have the legal boundaries, right? And yes, of course, these are extremely important. You know, Data Protection Act, Equality Act, GDPR, 
European Accessibility Act, HIPAA, and ADA, and all the other ones. This is really, really important, of course, but we really want to do more than just avoid a lawsuit. We want to do more than just the bare minimum. And for everyone here who's done testing for accessibility before, we also know the bare minimum doesn't actually work a lot of the time. So we get to defining the boundaries. Again, what are the edges of our habitable zone? Well, again, those real world consequences we talked about, they're very, very serious. Exposing someone's sensitive medical history, possibly their payment information, anything, you know, it's, it's all associated with their identity, everything that's happening in healthcare. And that's true for providers as well. Um, and these vulnerabilities are compounded for disabled users. They're at higher risk. A lot of times they might live in a uh, dependent living situation. So it does put them at higher risk if we accidentally expose their data. It's very serious. Um, so the boundary for security in healthcare experiences should be that we choose the most secure method of verification unless we have a reason of proportional impact and the explicit knowledge and consent of the user. So what about defining the boundaries for accessibility? Again, we do have WCAG for guidance, uh, but the question of whether an experience is truly accessible really depends on whether the users can complete their task in actuality. Were they able to independently sign up for the healthcare service they needed without someone sitting there with them, helping them with it? Um, did it take them a long time and cause them undue stress when they're already in a really stressful situation? And are there any alternatives for them to complete their task if the path they're using doesn't work for them for whatever reason? So that means that the boundary for accessibility and healthcare experiences should be that we always provide a way for users of various abilities to access their care in a reasonably low stress manner. All right, so we've defined these boundaries, hopefully. Um, but potentially created new problems for ourselves because now what this means is that when we're creating a new security measure, we have to ask ourselves, well, is a disabled user going to be able to access this experience without having to jump through too many hoops? And if we're optimizing for accessibility, we need to find out if we're creating any new security vulnerabilities. That sounds easy, no problem, right? But first, we just get the, the do nots out of the way. And one do. So CAPTCHAs, yes, we all love them. I love looking at pictures of bikes and confirming that I am not a robot. Yes, that's always something that makes you feel fantastic when you're logging in. Um, but more importantly, this just is not an accessible um, tool. It's not an accessible activity. Uh, both video and audio formats are not accessible, um, obviously, or not just video, visual, sorry. But, you know, obviously for a um, visually impaired user, you know, they can't pick the bike or whatever. And then audio formats are usually really garbled and hard to understand, so it's not really useful either. Um, and the other problem, too, is that the I am not a robot checkbox is actually really problematic. Because what it's doing is tracking the user's behavior prior to them interacting with the capture in order to determine if it looks human. Well, what if they're using assistive technology? You know, the, they might be using keyboard navigation or a speech input system or just an autofill in the form. And any of those can look like robotic behaviors. So we could misidentify a user as a robot, which means that we're actively dehumanizing them with our experiences. But there are, fortunately, things you can do. And of course, the most helpful one is the one we love the most, which is testing. You can always, always do testing. And we should always try to do testing with disabled users. And I want to specify not just disabled users, but um, when you can, users who use different assistive technologies, both actually, users who don't use assistive technologies and those who do. 
Um, obviously, there are frequently power users who are, you know, really, really good at whatever assistive technology they use. And then there are people that, you know, either they're newly disabled or again, maybe infrequently disabled. And so they really don't use any additional technologies. They just try to interact to the extent that they're able. So it's good to test with both of these groups. But the reason we do this is because the way people are actually using the tools in the wild, so to speak, is really nothing like we imagine it most of the time. I mean, even if you've used it yourself, often the way that you might use it is not the way that someone else will use it. And this is something you'll hear a lot of disability advocates speak about quite a bit is that there's really no one way to use these technologies. Everyone has their own accommodation that they've created. Um, so that's why it's important to test with these users. You can learn a lot from witnessing a nonverbal autistic person using an augmentative and alternative communication device, which is extremely cool, by the way. Um, a visually impaired user wrestling with poor screen reader implementations and a quadriplegic person using their own custom adaptations for keyboard inputs. There are actually some YouTube videos um, that, again, disability advocates I recommend following. They're wonderful. Um, but they, a few of them have shared how rather than using an adaptive keyboard, they prefer to literally rig up like two pencils on their hands and type that way because it's easier for them and they can take it with them wherever they go. So uh, it's really neat to see how people use things. And testing that really, really helps us understand and find those opportunities and limitations that we need to know to create these experiences. So another don't do is telling them, hey, if this digital experience didn't work for you, just call support because that's not inclusive, right? We have users who are nonverbal. We have those uh, who experience social distress from phone calls and a user maybe is in a location where they can't take a private call. If it's not a private call, it's not a secure call. And so they really can't call to resolve their problem if they're gonna have to give you the last four digits of their social security number <laughs> over the phone. Um, so that's not really a viable option. It doesn't mean we shouldn't give them a support number. It's actually a really good and helpful thing to do. It just can't be the only option they have if they can't complete their experience digitally. Okay, so the first of our potential solutions, two-factor authentication. Uh, so we know what we should not do. Let's talk about what we should do. Does this one qualify as just right? To start off with, it's definitely more secure than just a password. Um, it's much more difficult for bad actors to find both, find a matching pair, you know, the, both factors. Um, than just a password alone, especially if the second factor is time limited, which is very, very common. Um, but the setup process for two-factor authentication is really difficult for users of all abil abilities. And there are a lot of users who will just get so frustrated <laughs> by the high friction that they will just want to opt out completely. I'd just rather not do this. Um, but in healthcare, still that higher level of friction might be appropriate because uh, you do have to protect that sensitive information and uh, try to prevent errors. So uh, we still might want to use this despite some of the potential drawbacks. And so some options that can maybe help people do a little better is remember my device. I think the important thing to keep in mind about remember my advice is it does require users to accept cookies and disable ad blockers to function. So we actually have to be really transparent about the privacy impact that this creates so that we empower the users to make the decision that is best for them. And then since the setting is not usually indefinite, we also have to be transparent about the duration because how many times have we selected remember my device and then we come back and it doesn't? And maybe it was beyond the time frame. So we have to make sure we're letting users know that, setting their expectations appropriately so they're not surprised when they're asked for the second key at a later date. And finally, it's really helpful to include a note about how the option should not be used for shared devices. And speaking of remembering, really can't rely on the user's memory for authentication. This is really important. It's actually, again, this came up earlier today. It's, it's not accessible to ask people to remember 
any sensitive information at all. And passwords, of course, you know, passwords we all famously forget. I gave the example of forgetting my kid's birth date. So <laughs> it's not reliable. We need to allow other methods for cognitively impaired users to um, get both keys, hopefully. So what this means is that we offer SMS delivery for the authentication key. Um, it's actually not the most secure option, but it is one of the more accessible ones. So this is one of those places where we are finding that balance. Uh, we want to enable copy-paste for passcodes so that they don't have to input it manually. We want to avoid personal security questions. Those are just such a huge risk for, um, for any kind of security breach. But more importantly, you know, again, people can't always remember what they put. I, I don't remember the question I was asked recently, but I remember it was something where, or I, I don't remember is the point, um, but there was something I was asked recently that I just didn't remember what I had answered to the security question. So it's, what is the point of this? It's not, to, it's secure against me. It's keeping me from accessing my own information. That's not what we want. It's so secure, I can't get to it. So can't, don't wanna do that. But then we also want to use an email or SMS password recovery flow. Uh, again, password recovery is really important. There's a lot of aspects to it, but it's really important to permit them something that is hopefully easy and straightforward and goes to their personal device rather than some other complex flow. And the important thing is to give the user clear information and choices. We're letting them decide how much friction they're willing to tolerate for the level of security that they prefer. So next, we're going to talk about biometrics. And this is potentially fingerprint, eye, facial recognition, and voice recognition. It's a really great option for speedy logins. I'll be completely honest and say, I really love just being boop with my finger and being into my device and whatever else I need. It's really nice. But it does have kind of a difficult setup process as well. Uh, and it has demonstrated racial and gender bias. It's got a high rate of error in facial recognition. So this is a huge problem, obviously. Again, it's not an inclusive technology, even if it's more convenient for some people. So just something to keep in mind. And of course, if the account were ever compromised, the user's personal biometric data would be exposed. That's obviously extremely serious. <laughs> uh, and it's important to consider that organizations sometimes change leadership and new leaders are less scrupulous than their predecessors. I will let you guess who I'm thinking of. I'm not going to tell you, but I'm sure you can figure it out. And there are actually emerging risks right now with the rise of generative AI. Um, it's deep fake technology could actually compromise digital security sooner rather than later. Um, so when we're using any biometric information, like someone's unique image or voice, we really need to seriously consider whether that verification method will be reliable in an AI-dominated world. So we have to know, is the data we're collecting actually creating additional risk for the user? And keep in mind that for somebody who has eye differences, limb differences, prosthetics, biometric identification may not even be possible. So always offer another option. It's a good option, but it can't be the only one. All right, and then we do want to make sure our experiences accept form fill tokens. To keep these secure, we're going to require approval rather than allowing automatic fill. So instead of just entering it automatically, say, you know, allow whatever your password manager is to fill form, approve. Um, and this is important because there are bots that will try to uh, create fake fields on a page to steal people's personal information. So that's why we make sure that we always um, get their permission before filling the form. So it can't be done automatically without their knowledge and consent. Um, but by permitting password managers to fill your forms, this reduces the need for typed keyboard input 
And that's a really, really important accessibility feature. Just in general, anytime you can reduce typed keyboard input in any of your experiences, that's a good thing. And I know providers talk about this a lot too. This is why so many of them like to use dictation software is oh, less typing, thank goodness. So checkboxes, it seems so basic and so benign, but there are so many things that can go wrong. <laughs> um, so especially because in healthcare, it's often related to sharing sensitive information with an organization, provider, caregiver. And so it's really important, again, for us to maintain the user's agency. We're going to obtain their clear consent by offering an explicit rather than implicit conditional opt-in method. So this means instead of having the, uh, you know, by hitting submit, you're going to, you're giving us uh, consent for whatever, you've automatically opted in because you're using our product. And it's like, no, you have to explicitly opt in to whatever it is. It can't just be included as, you know, uh, an option, sorry, as a uh, implicit condition. And then also we need to leave the box unchecked by default because we can't just allow that frictionless experience to have people agreeing to something that maybe they didn't realize that they did or they didn't want to. So we want to make sure that this additional click is an appropriate level of friction for the user. Okay. Sorry, I get very excited about this. This is my one nerdy thing in here. Well, one of my nerdy things in here. Um, this is a really common mistake. And I bring it up precisely because it is so common. And I call it nested form controls. I have heard other names for it. And what this is, is a link in the text of a checkbox label. And that actually breaks the experience for keyboard navigation users. And the reason why is because it's two controls in a single object. So there's multiple actions when you're using keyboard navigation. It's select to hear it announced, and then it's select again to actually toggle the control and say, yes, I want to activate this control. Well, there's two controls here. There's the checkbox, and there's the link in the label. So it's going to announce, and maybe we could use RA labels to fix the announcement the screen reader has, but we haven't solved the problem of the two controls. When they select, which one are they trying to select? Do they want to open the link so they can read? Or are they trying to check the box to say, I agree? We don't know. It's broken. It doesn't work. And the solution to this is really so simple, although I will say very difficult to find. <laughs> it took me a while to find an example of this being done correctly. Uh, funny enough, it was on the Disney reservation site, so you know where I'm going after this. Um, <laughs> but it's it, all they do is just put the relevant link immediately before the checkbox. It's in context. It allows the user to read it if they choose to. And I know most people don't, but it's still really important for it to be there and to be available to them. And so it's there for them to read if they like. And then they understand in context. We go to the next uh, object, the next item here. And it's very clear that you are agreeing to what you just read or chose not to read. Um, and everyone understands. I have seen versions of this where it's actually swapped and it's I agree to the following terms and conditions and then the next object is the terms and conditions. Um, I think that's a little messier, but sometimes people like that because visually it looks more like um, what we're all accustomed to. And so that is a compromise that could be made, but the critical thing is separating them into two different components so that we have one control in one label and another control in a label, and they are not part of the same object. Okay, error prevention. Another thing that we have talked about today and that is extremely important. Uh, we talked about this. It's important for providers who are suffering burnout. It's really bad out there, particularly bad since COVID. Um, you know, I think a lot of us have seen this or potentially personally experienced it. Um, and so on the one hand, we do need to provide providers as much control over their experience as possible. This is something I get a lot in user interviews with providers um, is, 
yes, I appreciate all the help and everything, but also you potentially have created so much friction for me that I can't use this. You know, I need to have control over all my tools so that I can do what I need to do as quickly as possible when time matters. So it is important. We have to do that. We want them to be able to deliver care quickly and accurately, but it is nice if we can offer features that will help them avoid errors. It's good for them, it's good for the patients, good for everybody. And usually a simple pop-up is enough. Um, an example that I like to use is that there are some providers who might want to use screen sharing during a telehealth visit. So maybe they have a patient and they want to review a treatment plan with them. Uh, or they got lab results back and they want to review those with them or whatever. Sometimes there's even group sessions actually. And there are resources used during group sessions where there will be, um, again, screen sharing is really helpful to whatever conversation they're having. So this is a really impart, important tool for providers. But the thing about screen sharing, and we know this, is that uh, it's not always easy to select the right screen to share. <laughs> <laughs> and I know for a lot of people, myself included, sometimes I'll just be like, ah, eh, share full screen, it's fine. And so that's a problem if a provider who is multitasking and has a lot going on and they just came from one visit and as soon as this is done, they're going to go to the next visit and they've got their EMR open in the background with a different patient's information on it. And I say this because I've seen it happen. Um, and so how do we handle that? How do we avoid that privacy violation? Uh, really, we just have the pop-up. That's all it really needs. It's just that little bit of extra friction saying, hey, you're about to share your screen. Make sure you close anything that might have sensitive information in it. And that's really all you need. And so similarly, a patient who's going to be chatting with their therapist needs to be alerted as to whether the messaging platform they're using is secure. It's okay for them to use it if they understand that it's not secure. So some people want to text their therapist or whatever. That's, that's okay as long as both parties understand and are in agreement that that's what they're doing. Um, but they have to be informed. Um, and otherwise, obviously, it needs to be a secure platform. Um, but also, some modes of care delivery are not really appropriate for certain conditions. Uh, so users need to have the information and ability to self-select out of an experience that is not the right fit for them. And I have a specific example, which actually also came up today. All right, so to go back to our telehealth example or our telehealth scenario that we're talking about here, sometimes a patient might require a current blood pr pressure, blah, I can't even say it, blood pressure reading. There we go. Was that your question? No, whose question was that earlier? Someone talked about blood pressure readings. Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, that was good. I, I was like, oh, yay, I know that one. Uh, but this is something that comes up and uh, not everyone has a blood pressure cuff at home. You know, in fact, most people don't. Uh, but there are, are a lot of, of treatment plans. There are a lot of, uh, you know, diagnoses that really require a blood pressure reading. And so if you're in an office, no problem. But if you're doing telehealth or, you know, some other type of online care, that's a problem. So, uh, they need to know that this is something they're going to be asked to do or that will be required in order for them to receive care before they get into the experience. Because otherwise, they're giving all this personal data, personal information, before finding out, hey, I'm not actually eligible for this experience or this tool can't really provide me value because of my situation. Um, I've seen this happen where you know, trying to assess risk for certain conditions. And maybe the first question in the flow is your date of birth. So here you've given your personal identifying information. And a few questions later, it's what's your current blood pressure reading? So, uh, oh no. So now you're stuck, but you've also given your information. So that's just something we really need to be aware of. And then these examples highlight security, but are they accessible? And this brings us to that most overlooked and yet critical aspects of accessibility, and that is comprehensible language for cognitive impairments. Some of us, I'm sure, have personal experience with many of these. Could have a learning disorder. The user might suffer from chronic migraines. They could have insomnia. 
they could be neurodivergent and struggle to accurately read tone. They might have brain fog from long COVID. Maybe the experience is unavailable in their first language. Or maybe they're just of advanced age experiencing dementia, Alzheimer's, could be any number of things. And so whatever their chronic or situational cause, all of us are going to at some, at some point experience cognitive difficulties. So the, dif so the digital experiences need to be easy for everyone to understand. And that might mean slowing down your onboarding process so that your users have an opportunity to carefully read and process all the relevant information. Um, I'm just gonna mention briefly, I think Flow, the app Flow does a really good job with this. Um, they do only a couple questions at a time and then they reassure you with, here's the value of what you just gave us. Here's how we use it. Here's other happy you know, uh, users and what they say and everything. So they really allow you to take your time and process what you're doing. It's hilarious because it creates like a 90 page onboarding flow, which sounds a lot, but it actually is really successful in getting um, buy-in from the user and, and really making sure they're very, very well informed before they're adding sensitive information to this app. It also might mean including more detail for clarity or maybe what your user needs is less detail. Maybe they need it in a bulleted list because that's easier to understand. They can focus on one point at a time. It is best to stick with a lower grade reading level for copy. Um, I'm not actually aware of what the standard is in the UK, but in the US, we always say sixth grade reading level or below. So use a standard, sometimes you'll hear recommended even less. It's about the same. Okay. That's great. Perfect. Yeah. So for eight year olds, then make sure an eight year old can understand. And also avoid too much medical or legal language, unless, of course, your user is a provider, which brings me to, if you have access to one, I recommend using a consumer health vocabulary. In the UK, that's referred to as a patient-friendly terminology. Um, these are typically available, uh, government institutions, um, a lot of universities will manage these. And so if you're able to integrate, um, especially if you're using like a SNOMED or something like that, if you can integrate with these, it's super, super valuable because it's a collection of everyday terms that a patient might use. So heart attack matched with the clinical term for it. So myocardial infarction. So that your uh, consumers, they can use the words that feel natural to them. So we also want to have multiple modes of content delivery. This goes back to making sure there's not only one way to access the information. So we might want to, firstly, offer our experiences in multiple languages. That's a huge aid to comprehension, um, and we don't always need to rely on Google Translate. <laughs> we should hopefully be able to uh, offer as many languages as we are able. Uh, also, we can offer images and videos for low literacy users. So think of this as instead of uh, having a big block of text or maybe as an alternative or in addition to a big block of text, we have some video that just explains, hey, here's what we need from you. Here's what you're going to be doing. This can be really, really helpful. Sign language videos, also really helpful. Another one to keep in mind, though, is sign language. Um, most people know this, but just in case you're not aware, uh, it is actually different um, from nation to nation. So just make sure you have the right sign language for whatever your population is. Uh, and then of course, closed captions. And side note, of course, closed captions create transcripts, which SEO loves. So it's a win-win for everyone. And these are the modes that help keep users informed in an accessible way. All right. What information is important enough to deserve the user's attention? Uh, does an anxious parent trying to get an appointment for their sick child really need a carousel highlighting your latest press release before they see a list of available doctors? Does a provider need a pop-up letting them know there's a tutorial available for your newest feature when they're really just trying to update a patient chart? They probably don't. 
but they do need clear notice if they're about to share private data so they don't do so without explicit consent. So it's very important not to divide the user's attention. Okay, and that all brings us to the possibly unsolvable problem. What do we do if a user needs to withdraw or transfer consent? And this can be very difficult because a lot of our tools in healthcare are not designed to forget important user data because it's really important and we need it for their health. So the use case I'm gonna give here is a minor reaching the age of majority. It's one of the things we don't think about, but it happens all the time. You know, we think of patients as like, hey, you have a child patient, you have an adult patient. Yeah, but eventually the child becomes an adult and then what do you do? Uh, so their private healthcare data has up until that point been owned by their guardian. But when they come of age, the new young adult might need to transfer ownership of their account and withdraw consent for the guardian's access. So we could maybe verify identity by phone, but we've already talked about the reasons why that's not always an accessible option. And asynchronous digital experiences are potentially vulnerable to impersonation and bots. If someone could scrape this data from somewhere else, they could impersonate somebody. And that means that you're not really successfully verifying their identity in a case where we really can't afford to make mistakes. So how do we make that transaction secure and accessible? A potential solution is based on something that came about during um, the earlier days of COVID, uh, which was verifying or certifying the results of a COVID test online. And so what it involves is a patient begins a secure video telehealth visit they follow the instructions of the assistant and they administer a rapid COVID test. The user then places the test in full view of the camera for the duration of the waiting period. So 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is, it's in front of the camera the whole time from when they took the test based on instructions all the way up to when the result is ready to read. And then they read the results together and the provider is able to verify and certify that result without requiring the user to visit in person or interact with a complex system. So this is great for immunocompromised users. Uh, they don't have to go in person and they can get their, res their result verified, but also uh, really great for, it was used quite a bit for cruises. <laughs> you needed a certified COVID test to go on a cruise and sometimes uh, it was really difficult to get one. So this was one way that people could do it. But it's a fair question to ask, well, how is a disabled user going to share their identification in a video call? Well, this is where we can take inspiration from another tool. Who's familiar with Be My Eyes? Yeah? Yes, I love Be My Eyes. It's fantastic. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, this is an app that connects blind and visually impaired users with sighted volunteers who help them with daily tasks. So a user would initiate a call, the assisting volunteer is actually connected to their camera. Um, and their camera is, it's the, what is it, the front facing camera? Um, so that, you know, whatever they're seeing, the assistant can see, volunteer can see. Um, and they can help them with things like selecting clothes, groceries, reading a recipe, choosing a greeting card, and so on. So the way we might be able to use this in our scenario of the new young adult who needs to withdraw access for their guardian so that they own their healthcare data is creating what I'm calling synchronous remote ID verification. And that's maybe they launch a video call and they verify identification credentials, again, guided by a assistant. And eventually their data will be confirmed by the assistants on the phone, or not the phone, the video call, so they can transfer their access to themselves. This could also work for the nonverbal users that I mentioned earlier, as long as their needs are considered 
in the journey design. There are some aspects to still consider, like how to protect against scams, um, but it's an example of how to prioritize security and accessibility to make the digital experiences just right. That's fantastic. That's awesome. That's so exciting. Yay. That's wonderful to hear. If anyone could not hear, by the way, saying that this is used in the NHS app now. So here we are. We've made it to the Goldilocks zone. It's the habitable zone, the just right space. We are here at the intersection of security, where we choose the most secure method of verification, unless we have a reason of proportional impact and the explicit knowledge and consent of the user and accessibility, where we make sure there's always a way for users of various abilities to access their care in a reasonably low stress manner. And to achieve this, we've preserved the user's agency by providing them options. They get to decide the level of ease and security that they prefer. And that's everything, thank you. Really, really great presentation. Thank you for sharing that. Do we have any questions from the audience at the back? Any others? Yeah. Hello, Duncan from UserVish again. Um, thanks very much. That, that was wonderful. I really loved the way that you presented uh, accessibility and security as a balance. And the example of two-factor authentication made me laugh because we experienced that in a previous workplace of mine. It was like Clash of the Titans, the accessibility <laughs> team and the information security team. Like, who's going to win? Um, <laughs> But I guess in my experience, people who work in cybersecurity and information governance are very passionate, um, perhaps for good reason. But, um, you know, we've encountered situations where, for example, uh, you know, uh, an information governance team might not like us to run a survey with free text fields in case people divulge personal medical information in it. Um, what success have you had, or, or how, how, how have those conversations gone for you? How, how can you um, find that reasonable compromise that a passionate information security professional will accept? I think it's important to consider that while the consequences of a security breach are very serious, the consequences of a disabled user being unable to access a service that they need are just as serious. So that's usually how I would frame it is I would say, I, your concerns are valid. I get it. Um, this is also important. And then I would look for ways to inform users, hopefully, rather than just closing off paths to them. So that's what I would recommend. Okay, another question here? Yeah. Hi, thanks. I really love that. Um, I'm wondering if you or anyone else here has had any experience. Um, I'm working on a, an AI project at the moment, and it's my first real in-depth relationship with legal and risk. And um, just any success that you've had with getting legal and risk colleagues who are not UX designers to care more about the user than they do about the company. Um, yeah, any success from you or anyone else that anyone's had with that? I mean, for me, a lot of it is if I have to do the legwork of pulling all the information about the lawsuits for accessibility, that's what I will do. I'll say, you want to bypass this. You want to not make it as accessible. Here's examples of companies and organizations that the exact same thing. And there were very serious legal and financial consequences for them. Sometimes you can put it in financial terms. Here's the population you're missing out on. Again, in healthcare, potentially all of your user base is disabled So when they're using the tool. So it's really important you know, if, if, if they need to use the tool and if we're relying on them and those are our users uh, and that's where revenue comes from, you know, you're, you're missing out on revenue if you aren't, don't serve them and their needs. So I would, I would, you know, for legal and compliance, of course, I would focus more on the legal consequences. But for anyone you need to make that argument to, there are numerous examples of people choosing to do the bare minimum or less, and they paid for it. I'd like to um, add to this as well. Mm -hmm. So 
I'm sure we can all appreciate anybody doing any job, whether it's your professional job, it's one you're doing personally as a hobby, whether you're problem solving. You may not always see it like that, especially if you're doing it for entertainment purposes, but you're bored, so you are playing the game, you're deciding which game to play, that's a problem solved. Now I say that is that if you're facing someone who is solving a problem from a perspective that you don't like, how can you change the problem for them so they see it from a different perspective? And I would suggest doing that using a job story. Mm -hmm. Who here is not familiar with job stories? Hands up job stories. So jobs, who's familiar with user stories? I think pretty much everybody. The user story is very similar to a job story. A job story tends to just clarify the context of why someone would want to perform the task and what the goal looks like. So in the scenario, given that this person is blind and we need to get them to use this digital solution so that they can fill in this government document so they can fly to a funeral. Mm -hmm. You know, suddenly it's like, oh, I see the constraint. Because that's all the work we're doing as um, problem solvers, as designers. We, des we have to identify the constraints to narrow down our options. You don't know what the options are because you're not in legal and compliance. They do. So you said, here is the constraint based on the job story. And this is the problem. Now tell me your legal governance jargon <laughs> and what, what you want us to do. Because you have to commit to this constraint. You can't ignore it because this is part of the problem. It's not an optional. The, adhering to the constraint is not optional. Yeah. You have to consider it. So that's my, my advice. Yeah. And it's also what, you know, we talked about earlier about how you're, you're not saying you're going to compromise security. You're not saying you're going to make a less secure experience and say, I'm going to make a secure experience that everyone can access. So I think that's really the key. Yeah, it's down to that perception that a lot of mm -hmm. um, non-designers have of designers. They think that we only use map books and wear really trendy clothes with flat caps <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> but that we don't really want to adhere to rules that we're rebellious. And, you know, some of us do wear trendy clothes and flat caps and we use map books, but we're trying to solve problems. I said before, and we want to know the constraints. It's okay that we have to adhere to legal governance um, um, requirements. That's not a problem for us. That's actually part of the fun is, oh, there's another part of this problem that's going to make it a bit challenging. But when we've completed that challenge, because that success is that we've delivered. That's a good thing. We get a sense of joy and you know excitement. The dopamine released <laughs> said yesterday. So yeah. Any any more questions? No. Thank you so much. It's been a really really great talk. <laughs>